Hi, everyone. Welcome, and thank you for joining the American Cinematheque online Q&A for the Midnight Sky. I'm Gwen de Glees, Deputy Director, and I'd like to invite you to visit our website, americancinematech.com, where you can find information about our upcoming program and how you can support the American Cinematheque by becoming a member and making a donation. I would like to thank Netflix uh, for uh, making this conversation possible. The Midnight Sky is streaming on Netflix. And this conversation is with 2006 American Cinematheque honoree, actor, director, George Clooney, a producer, Grant Heslov, cinematographer, Martin Rue, production designer, Jim Baisel, and visual effects supervisor, Matt Casimir. Moderating the discussion is a film historian and director, Jim Hemphill. Enjoy. Everybody, my name is Jim Hemphill, and I'd like to welcome you to this virtual Q&A for The Midnight Sky. Uh, I'm very excited to introduce all of the filmmakers who will be involved in this discussion. They're all people who I've admired for a long time. Uh, I'll introduce them in the order they're appearing on my screen here, which uh, means we start with production designer Jim Bissell, director, actor, and producer George Clooney, visual effects supervisor Matt Kazmir, Hello. director of photography Martin Rue, and Hello. producer Grant Heslov. Welcome, guys. So, uh, George and Grant, I want to start with you guys and ask a couple questions about the origins of the movie. Uh, how did this come to your production company? And, you know, was it, did it come to you as a book? Was there already a script? And what was it there about it that you guys responded to that made you want to make the movie? Well, go ahead, Grant. Um, it came to us as a script. Um, uh, Netflix sent it over for uh, us to look at to produce. Uh, for George uh, to direct and for George to be in, all of those things. And uh, we both read it, we, as we often do when we get something, we kind of like, we read it and we call each other even as we're reading it. What do you think? I'm loving this, you know, I'll call you, I'll call you back. And uh, we both really, we just, we just really connected to this material um, and thought it was a beautiful story. Um, and from that, you know, from that moment, George was like, well, maybe I'll play this part and uh, let's try to, let's try to get it made. And that's really how, that's how it came about. And what, uh, you know, what appealed to you about the part, George? Cause this guy is a little bit older than you. <laughs> Not really, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> you know, I, in, in reading it, you know, it's not a, this isn't a low budget film, you know, this is a pretty substantial film. And so, there are only a few guys that could uh, actually get it made, quite honestly. And, you know, as, if, if, as a director, if you're looking at it, you know, um, most of the guys that could are too young still. Brad's too young to do it, you know, guys like that. So in a way, it was, you know, out of necessity. I knew that it was a part I could play. Um, it was it was a fairly, it was really well written. And, uh, and I thought, you know, this was a good time to do a, a part like this. So I was excited about it. I was excited about playing the part. Mm -hmm. Well, opening it up to Jim and Matt and Martin, I was wondering if maybe you guys sort of one at a time could talk a little bit about the initial conversations you all had with George and Grant in terms of coming up with kind of guiding principles for what your approach was going to be to the movie and what it was going to look like. Uh, Jim, we can start with you. Uh, yeah, the initial conversation I had with George was he really didn't want it to look like all the other space movies. So that's that's where I started. Um, and uh, and we made some really interesting discoveries about cutting edge technologies and, uh, and, uh, and ways to go with the uh, design of the ether and little earth and, and how to address on a very practical level um, some of the things that deep space uh, travel entails like uh, artificial gravity and that sort of thing. And I think the more we tried to discover that and look at ways to represent it, uh, the more interesting the imagery got uh, and the sets uh, because a lot of what we, what we wound up designing it's pretty practical, but it's really interesting looking too. Mm -hmm. I reflected on, and then I think George's decision too, not to go with like a dystopic future and something that looks Mad Max for the research station, but instead reflected uh, Augustine's sort of inner self. You know, it's, uh, it's cold, it's reflective, it's very processing a lot of data and all that while he's trying to get in touch with, uh, you know, his life. 
Well, you mentioning the ether, you know, leads to a question I had when I was watching the movie, which is how much of the design was inspired by trying to think about like real world questions of how astronauts would live on this thing and how much was more imaginative or speculative? Uh, well, it's iterative. You know, it's uh, you, first of all, you do address all those issues because you want that to be evident in their environment. Um, and there are a lot of issues about protecting astronauts from radiation, about, uh, you know, how crazy people can go in two and a half years just, you know, with four of the people. Yeah, it's, uh, it's you know, there's a, there's a lot of psychology in the design of the interiors and the kind of things that they bring with them and, and what kind of activities are, 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 uh, are going to be scheduled just to keep them sane. And um, so there was a lot of that, a lot of research into that. And then, and then we go and look and see what we discovered and then start turning it around and trying to make it look really cool. Yeah. Uh, well, speaking of making it look cool, Martin, uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about when you came on board, what were your initial discussions like and what were the sort of, what was the sort of appeal of the movie to you and what did you see as challenges that were laying ahead? One of the big challenges was it's basically like two movies because you go to the Arctic where you might have less control over whatever you do there and then you go into space and then so as Jim described the space stuff was a long development and then it took you know I think when we started uh, we went through different phases and then until we landed where, it, where you know where ether is now um, and then um, George and I discussed that. We, he, George never wanted it to look too slick either. So, so he didn't want to his vision to be too far away from what's real now and, and um, uh, never too slick. And then we um, decided to route for 65 mil. We shot it in 65 mil because I thought it was the right format for the big vistas in, um, in the Arctic and also for you know, what we then realized with, with um, the first camera test we did is that it's really great for um, for intimacy and then for, for, you know, faces because there's so much resolution in that. And when you get close to the faces, they start looking like landscapes and then, but yet it's very intimate. So this was uh, where we started. And um, yeah, with Matt's help, we took it some, some other place. Uh -huh. Well, uh, Matt, talk a little bit about your role on the movie and how it started and how you kind of worked with these these guys with Martin and Jim, how you coordinated. Well, it was kind of a core cool team anyway. So we, we've always had a, a shorthand. This is my third film with these guys. And uh, it was a bit daunting actually, because in my mind, some of the best zero gravity scenes uh, is a film that George happened to star in. Right. And so I was slightly intimidated because in all honesty, George probably knew more than I did, even though it was on the other side of the camera. And early on, George and Grant and Jim, you know, it was made evident this isn't a visual effects spectacular. This isn't whizzes and bangs and spaceships flying around. This is an intimate drama piece about a, a guy dying, reconciling his past. And I think that was my biggest... Uh, challenge was how do you sympathetically deal with so much complexity without having a heavy hand and making a presence that obvious uh, and I, you know and I think with the help of Jim Martin and George and Grant it that was I think the biggest achievement of visual effects is it's it's subtle in its grandeur it's it's not it's not smugly taking center stage it's it's leaving that to you know the cast and the sets and the photography and uh you know and martin said to me very early on he said i want to shoot this as if i had my camera kit out there in space i don't want to pretend i'm on a jetpack floating around with impossible lenses i want to use my lens package i want to light it i want to light it with the sun you know, and you guys figure it out. And there was a lot of back and forth. You know, hence well, we use virtual cameras. A lot of fighting. A lot. <laughs> yeah. Lots of fighting. <laughs> Lots of fighting. Well, you know, another thing I wanted to ask about in terms of visual effects is, you know, it's such a 
for a science fiction movie, I mean, there's the spectacle element, but it's also very performance driven. And I'm curious, you know, how you guys sort of created an environment that would facilitate the best work on the part of the actors so that they didn't necessarily have to be reacting to blue screens and tennis balls and all that kind of stuff. I mean, I read that you guys had came up with sort of an interesting LED system. I was wondering if you could talk about that. Oh, absolutely. Uh I mean, first things first, I have an utter distrust, like everyone else, of blue screens. Uh, I feel they sat performances. Uh, from a photography point of view, you know, I don't like having to throw away a third of the image just because it's blue. And uh, we embraced lots and lots of different techniques. One of them, like you mentioned, was the LED wall. Now, early on, Jim had designed this fantastic, you know, show me sketches of this beautiful uh, barbeau observatory and it was going to be quite reflective there was lots of stainless steel chair legs there was lino on the floor which would reflect and it would have been a shame to have just stuck a blue screen outside and then sucked out all of this information what it needed was some life so we uh straight off the back of mandalorian we'd been talking to rlm we used their stagecraft and uh we Put, erected a, a 30 foot by 130 foot wide LED wall around our set. I flew off to Iceland eight weeks before principal production to shoot plates and digitize the environment. So this could be played back on these walls with some very clever camera trickery, which worked out the camera parallax. So it didn't look flat like a translator, it would move like reality. And as luck would have it, that was, I think, the only snow we physically saw out there, apart from the the, uh, the storms that George had to act in. We didn't actually see any snow on the set, so I'm glad we did, because it also, gave us something to... Uh, also, he, uh, you know, the design was the camera had a camera on it, and there were little cameras placed all over the set, so that as the camera would move up or down, the background, the LA, LED, uh, your perspective would change on it. So it was yeah. really incredibly complex uh, uh, piece of equipment and really helped make it all feel very real. And, and I think Martin will tell you, I mean, it lit the set. I don't think you used many additional lights. No, that's the beauty of it because you can shoot ambience shots. Uh, you know, you have ambience lighting. There's one shot is particularly when Augustine is standing in the control room, he's looking out in the early morning and then we see through the reflections and that's shot for real in a studio and how else would you do that because, you know, unless you use complicated trickery, but that's in camera as it was there and we use the, the LED wall to light the set and, and at the same time give us the reflection, it looks so real and, and uh, also for for you know, half a lot of the scenes were with Iris, the little girl, and she had, you know, when she was looking outside, she would see the environment, which was uh, meant to be there, which is very helpful. George, too, would see the environment. He, he, yeah, he, yeah. I'm like a kid where you take me to the mall to get a picture taken, you know? <laughs> yeah, in fact, we got about, a, I'd like to say, you know, 120 shots, VFX shots in camera this way. So, they were done and dusted before post, which was fantastic for me and our schedule. Uh, well, Grant, I wanted to ask you a little bit about the logistics of shooting the stuff in Iceland, because that just looked to me like, uh, you know, would have been a fairly miserable experience. I mean, how challenging was it doing that stuff? Why did you choose Iceland? Uh, talk a little bit about that. It, well, it was challenging. I think everybody on here will attest to that. Um, you know, when you see George up on that mountain and you see that those whiteouts and that, that was real, that's, you know, that's uh, sub-zero temperatures and 50 to 60 uh, mile per hour winds. So it, it was crazy. I mean, there were times when we would have to attach a rope to George so we didn't lose him during a shot. Um, on most films though. That is, <laughs> we, call, we, we call it a leash, but whatever. Um, you know, Iceland just, it, first of all, they have a they have really good uh, production support there. They have a great production services company that we worked with, <laughs> um, and and you need it because there's a lot of safety concerns. You know, when you're up, uh, we're, we shot up on a glacier, 
we're six, we're six mile, a six hour drive from Reykjavik. So we really are in the middle of nowhere. I mean, there isn't much else on Iceland except for Reykjavik. Once you get out of there, it's just these little tiny fishing villages. Um, uh, but we really wanted it to feel authentic. We wanted it to we wanted it to have a real authenticity, um, and uh, it was. I think everybody everybody here is thrilled. We we went there. So it was really a, a great experience, and I think it looks I think it looks great. Mm-hmm. Well, how did shooting there? You know, for Jim and Matt and Martin and George, um, how did shooting there kind of inform? what you were doing. I mean, like in other words, you know, Martin, how was the style of the cinematography changed or uh, directed by the environment you were shooting in? Well, we were adapting to the glaciers. So, so for, you know, it means you go to, from a hotel, you go to base camp, and then it's a lot of logistics. So you try to get as little crew and as little, little gear there, yet that's still a big operation because you gather every morning, you gather your gear, you put it on whatever mo- um, vehicles to get out there, then you drive for half an hour onto the glacier and then you start shooting and then you don't know what the elements will be. So so you have to adjust very quickly. We did a lot of handheld cameras out there. We were in that snowstorm, um, you know, even changing a lens would take 20 minutes because they the cameras were so tech and um, tied up and you know to unpack them with the in the eyes um change the lens that would be a long operation so you would be try to do that not too often also you have to you know you can't do 15 takes because you feel like it's not the right thing yet because um, you have to protect the actors out there and then um, it was really tough so out there we were adapting a lot and then we were trying to keep it as simple as possible i think we brought out a crane for one shot Hmm. um or two shots and then but other than that we kept it really simple when we could we would do steadicam maybe but um you know other than that it's it's handheld it's a lot of handheld cameras there and george i imagine it probably wasn't that difficult to pretend to be freezing and miserable as as an actor in those scenes yeah, that wasn't so hard. No, look, it was, it, it was tricky because, you know, we'd be standing on a glacier and it would be perfectly blue skies. You could see for 100 miles. And we don't want that necessarily. You know, we want some bad weather. And, you know, when you see those sequences, that's not a snowstorm we're in. That's a windstorm blowing up snow off of the ground. It's perfectly blue sky and it would suddenly be blacked out, like a literally like a sandstorm coming in. And so we'd see it coming and everybody get ready and tie people down and everybody's way and they go shoot and then we just start shooting in this brutal wind and you know it's, it's like these little tornadoes that we would get into and you know this is what you know people in film do we rush towards those kind of things because we want to that's what we needed and so it was a it was kind of like the minute those picked up we ran and would shoot that and you know there was it, there was i'm usually you know, uh, you know, Jim would tell you because we we started our first film together with Confession of a Dangerous Mind. I usually draw out every single shot in every single scene, and have you get them with your sides in the morning, so we know exactly what shots we're going to shoot. You know, and and we're really efficient that way. This was harder to be efficient, but we also, you know, the, it didn't get light until ten thirty in the morning, eleven o'clock in the morning, and it was dark by three thirty or four, and we've got you know, a seven-year-old girl, which have time constraints. So you had to really work like, you know, it was just pure focus on what we could get done, you know, in the exact moments. It was, it was, it was challenging, but, you know. We also, we also called a lot of audibles. Every day was an audible, depending on the weather, depending on, you know, all of a sudden George would go, I like that spot right there. Let's, let, let's shoot this scene here. It just, you know, but it's really fun. It's a fun. It's a fun way to work. Yeah, and cold. <laughs> well, going back inside the ship, uh, Jim, I wanted to ask you about one of my favorite things in the movie was the way, and I guess this is really a question for you and Matt, the way you conceptualized the sort of virtual reality environments where the people would visit their own, you know, sort of have the memories of their own families around them. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit. I thought that was a really original way of doing that that was a little different than what I'd seen in other sci-fi movies. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about where you came up with the idea for that and how you executed it. 
Well, it's it's sort of back to the idea that it's really practical, you know, that they actually created this thing. And so it uh, we we came up with a backstory that uh, NASA or whatever the space agency was that was sort of supervising this journey. Um, when they recruited astronauts, what they would do is say, all right, what what is an uh, insta incident that would really ground you? If things get really tough up there in space, what uh, where would you like to be? And so everybody picks their sort of favorite moment or two. Uh, you know, one of the actors picked uh, having a, having a, uh, a time in the kitchen with his family before the kids went off to play soccer and uh, and uh, the other one picked uh, the brownstone stoop where she hung out with her best friend from high school and her sister and her cat and so what the uh, what the space agency would do is just go and do uh, uh, a point of view and create a 3d a virtual experience for with the uh, with the actor so the actor can sit in, uh, with the uh, so the astronaut can sit in the middle of this and then, and you saw that wall that is sort of modular and there's just places that sit that correspond to the actual environment that they've just done this virtual uh, virtual thing. And so it's semi-practical. I mean, it's, it, that way it's not, it didn't go into the Star Wars realm where they're just sort of creating, you know, holographic images out of nowhere. It's, it's, it's a thing where people can go and get grounded, you know, when they're, when they're starting to get upset or they're, what we found was for instance in, uh, on the International Space Station, most of the astronauts spend most of their time looking at Earth. Mm -hmm. And if you're on a space voyage, you can't do that. You know, you're just, you're, you're isolated. And so that's, that's what this is supposed to compensate for. This thing is. Uh, and Jim, don't you think, and part of the conversation we had when we came up with the idea of doing these was that basically our idea was it's VR without the, without the goggles, you know, yeah. so that you're in it. And it's, you know, and we figured in 30 years, we might be able to figure out a way to do it without having to put the, you know, the goggles on, so. Exactly. And again, I think, George, you know, you you said to me, this had to be the modern equivalent of a well-thumbed photograph. It had to be warm and almost old-fashioned kind of sepia. It had a look of grain and uh, use and homeliness, as well as being modern. And, uh, you know, and... Again, I think with Jim's designs and some very, you know, beautifully crafted, subtle uh, CG augmentation to that, it comes across as a, as, a, as a warm place and it goes a long way, as a photograph often does in filming, explaining someone's backstory and it did it very beautifully. Um, yeah, I mean, we've been talking a lot about the, the technical side of this and I, I wanted to ask George, because I really loved your performance in the movie. And I was curious, you know, what are the pleasures and what are the challenges of acting in a movie like this where so many of your scenes are either solitary or with one other actor? I mean, in this case, a really very good young actor who I, I'd never seen before. Yeah, we'd never seen her before either. This is a first acting job. She she saved the day in a way. We She probably saved us four or five days of shooting that we'd budgeted for because you know it's a seven-year-old kid you, you she could throw a tantrum or she you know she's never acted before and everything we did with her was one take you know one or two takes which made a huge difference but also it was fun because i could go to the other actors and say the seven-year-old did it in one <laughs> Not um for me as an actor you know i uh, jim gave me so many pieces of the set that i could actually live and be in so it wasn't really all that challenging and it's certainly easier to not have a lot of dialogue uh, mm -hmm. particularly when you're directing um you know uh it's a lot harder when you're when, when you have a lot of lines to learn as well um but you know I, again it was you know actors perform best when they're right for a role you know i've been wrong for roles and i haven't been very good in them and i've been right for them and it's worked out so um in general you know, if you're cast in the right role, that's that's the hard work, you know, that's the good part. And then from then on, it's your job just not to try to, you know, screw it up. You know, that's all you're thinking about. Uh, well, I'm going to throw it out to some audience questions. A bunch of people are sending in questions from the audience. And the first one is uh, for George, having worked on ambitious space projects such as Solaris and Gravity, what did you take from those films and working with Soderbergh and Quaron that you brought to Midnight Sky? Well, the first thing is what 
not to do, and I mean, don't, don't replicate, you know, two directors who I happen to think are geniuses. Uh, part of it was also um, a learning from not mistakes, but from the difficulties that they experience. It's like, you know, if, after doing Perfect Storm, I know what not to do in the water, you know, because water, it, like space, just slows everything down. And so knowing that I had, you know, a lot of the technology that when we were doing Gravity, Alfonso was so far ahead of the, the technology at the time, they were still catching up while he was working on it. And so we'd have to wait for a period of time, you know, months. We came back and shot stuff eight months later when the technology caught up. Well, all that technology is long past now. And now, it, so there were a lot of things that were quite honestly much easier. When I did Gravity to do a lot of the, the um, weightless stuff, you know, I'm bolted in from the chest down into a, a, a 2,000 pound piece of machinery that they use to build cars with. And there's another 2000 pound piece of machinery on a track with that also has a camera so that I'm moving and it's moving. And so that you get that feeling and it comes like this close to you at, you know, 20 miles an hour, knock your head off. And you got a bunch of guys with like, you know, glasses and a pencil, you know, a, a pencil <laughs> container in their pocket, you know, going <laughs> and you're like, you're sure you're not going to take my head off. Right. So all of that stuff now is gone. You know, our, our, you know, we knew gravity taught me one very big feature, which uh, isn't always done in uh, in these films, which is there is no north or south. Um, uh, Jim kept talking about this all the time, and it was hard to get that in your mind that most films still work on a plane. And gravity constantly was rotating so that up is down because there is no up or down. Right. The, the, that's the hardest part to keep imagining. But you also have to be judicious about the way you do it because it will make people throw up. So you're, and on 65 millimeter, it's a big wide, you know, berth. So it was, you know, I learned a lot from them and I got a lot from the technology and the things that they worked uh, hard at getting when they didn't have the kind of uh, technology that we did. Uh, the next question is, uh, it's, I think there a lot of people on the panel could talk about this. Uh, how much of this epic project was done with set design and how much was with visual effects? I would like thank to you. thank Jim. I think it's all it's all set design, well, apart from the outer the outside of the ship isn't. But Jim, you can answer. Yeah, we built we built a lot, and uh, I think that was uh, uh, that was um, that gave George a lot of flexibility. First of all, in his, in his coverage of scenes, and it uh, and and it really made it feel a lot more real. You know, to be able to follow the actors up and down the different levels of the uh, of the living habitat of Little Earth. And uh, and I think, you know, that was, it was nice to be able to design the uh, spaceship concurrently with the interior set so that it, the interiors and exteriors uh, really related to each other. And I think that was where uh, Matt and his team did a brilliant job. Uh, but the one thing that I always, that I really love about the design is that sort of the, the haunting resonance of the, the baton that contains the centrifugal force that gives them the artificial gravity that helps them to survive two and a half years in space. It's, it's, um, it gives the, the, old, the ship this sort of odd, very vulnerable feeling. It doesn't look like sort of a flying warehouse or a, a flying industrial site. It looks like a dragonfly, you know, it's, uh, and, and, and the rotation of this baton sort of constantly marks the passage of time. And, and gives us this fragility of these sort of spinning bags of gas flying through space that uh, is really sort of a metaphor for what we, what we live, how we live on this planet, you know? And uh, I, I, I really liked the way that came out. And I thought the way that Matt brought it to life was brilliant. Yeah, these, so, yeah. these guys, all, all three, between Martin and Jim and Matt, they worked like a, you know, they worked like a, an orchestra. It was really beautiful. To, it was really seamless and fun. Uh, the next audience question is, how did you come up with the zero gravity bleeding scene? It was mind blowing. Well, it started with, um, you know, originally in the script, uh, uh, she runs out of oxygen, but you know, we did that in gravity. And so we started looking for other ways to kill her basically. 
And I was looking at some of the astronauts up in space, and they did a thing where they would throw water up and it would float around and they would drink it out of the air. So I talked to Jim and then eventually to Matt about the idea that, you know, that we could, could we make this blood, you know, could we, could we do this inside her helmet, just a slight hint of what's coming. And then when it comes off, could we let it float? And, you know, and we came up with a way to do it, but I kept saying to Matt, but it's a ballet. The, the, the blood has to move in a way that's a dance almost, um, because we're gonna, there is no dialogue. We're gonna pull the dialogue out. We're gonna let the music take over. We're gonna pull out of it and show this thing. And it's gonna be upside down. Uh, and so all the, while we were doing this, we were working on it, you know, it was the last thing finished really. And it's a leap of faith that you go, hey, Matt, is it gonna work? And he's like, oh, it'll work. And oh, it did. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't think you saw it until a uh, week before release. Uh, there were iterations, but yes, yeah, so it was a combination of uh, fluid dynamics and hand animating hero blobs. We gave all the blobs names. We would, we gave them personality. We gave them uh, paths and, you know, we treated them as any other character. And I think, again, going back to George, you know, he'd give me very firm direction in this is a really poetic moment where people who've been together for close to five years, you know, one of them's dying and it's not grotesque. It's not a horror film. It's not a visual effects film. And uh, yeah, George had a lot of uh, trust and faith in me because uh, there wasn't much to show for a, a long time. Jim and I started looking early on at things that when liquids would get loose in a, in a spaceship, you realize that they don't get absorbed. Right. They don't it doesn't it doesn't go into your clothes and get absorbed. So you don't get blood stains. You'd have to push up against it to sort of smash it in. So realizing that a dark red against this really white screen would just be bouncing, you know, bouncing off and moving sort of slowly through it felt really visual to us. And I think uh, I think that's what where we where we went from. And it uh, tied in beautifully with uh, Andre's music. Yeah. Alexander. And Alexander. Oh, sorry. It's okay. Uh, go ahead, Jerry. Sorry. No. <laughs> the, uh, the next audience question is um, for everyone, what science fiction movies inspired you growing up? So I guess we just go one at a time. 2001 Space Odyssey for me, that was the, that was the one. Jim, you're not allowed to say E.T. <laughs> Uh, I'd say probably Alien and uh, and 2001. I would say the first Star Wars. You're younger. <laughs> I, 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 in the cinema. <laughs> I watched Alien the other night again, like four nights ago. It's amazing how that movie holds up. It, it, you know, even the, the stuff that usually in science fiction movies ends up looking dated, with the exception of the size of the TVs and how thick they were. That movie is just, just technically a stunning film too. So yeah, Alien. That guy can direct. Yeah. yeah he's got some pretty good. Stuff. He's pretty good. Uh, Matt, what about you? Uh, I would probably say Terminator. Hmm. Just yeah, because it it had everything, and I you know it it's it was still based in in a reality, but an alternate reality. Uh, the next audience question this is another one that's for each of you uh, to answer. For each of you, what was the most technically difficult part of making this film? Hmm. Spacewalk was the most technically difficult, all of it, because that's, you know, that's, you know, you, you've got people on wires, they have to train for six weeks, and then, you know, there's just a the the ability just believe it or not not crossing wires when you're going and getting tangled up is is a real ballet because it's all automated and moving um and you know it started with i mean this is sort of an amazing thing we got to do that uh, jim and matt designed and martin was incredibly helpful with editing the previous for that whole section is they built a, the spaceship in vr for me and i had a monitor that was acting as a camera and goggles on and i was walking in this sort of gymnasium empty space and i'm walking around and i can go like this and look up and go okay that's my shot for this i'm literally on the spaceship it's like i'm walking on it 
And so you, you go down there and see, okay, there's the rotating arm and go up here and then go away and come back. So I got this great advantage of being able to, to work through that. And it was a really, it was really helpful. And then Martin sort of worked on editing it together. Martin and Matt did on piecing together the piece so that we knew exactly what we were going to do, but it's technical. It's not a lot of improvisation when you get to that. Yeah. That process took us probably two months yeah. to get it together to that. We would do sessions and go back and do, do more sessions and Steven edited it and we looked out to, at it together and then we decided, oh no, we need more or this is wrong or let's change the animation. You know, that, that, that took so, a long time to get there. Yeah, and I think, uh, again, the space war and for me, one of the most technical was uh, we used a performance capture system. So during the entire zero gravity sequence from airlock to airlock between 60 and 70 cast members faces the bodies were always going to be replaced and animated in cg but between 60 and 70 of the heads and the performances are entirely cg and uh quite a few of them i forget now you know i look and it is just the performance of the actor and it's it's the holy grail you know getting a believable CG face and it's a pretty fascinating thing too because for instance when you people won't understand this but when you blink you know you close your eyes slowly and you open them quickly in real life they go like this and they open quickly um and so you know he, Matt had to inc incorporate all of these elements that you don't even think about uh so we'd see the first take and you go they don't look real and then he goes oh let me let me slow down their blinks and and speed it up at the end and immediately it changed everything. It's really fascinating process. Uh, Jim, what would you consider the biggest challenge on the movie? Well, it was, uh, the, you know, the, uh, the Little Earth and then, then the uh, control module where the uh, command center was and where the different offices were. Those were just supposed to be big bags of air with this skeleton that basically supported the, uh, the floors. And it was, designed to look like these, these were top of, top of, topographically optimized structures. Um, so they were layered and, and being able to build these very odd spaces that were three stories high uh, that had this endoskeleton as well as a sort of layered fabric interior and, and accommodate all built-in lighting for, uh, for Martin, you know, it, uh, they, they were technically very challenging. We had to build an exterior steel structure to support them and really be very, very careful about the way that we made everything wild and, uh, and represented these spaces because they're, they're pretty extraordinary spaces. They're unlike anything anybody's seen before, but, uh, but they, were, they were difficult to sort of put together and, uh, and structurally. Yeah, with, with Jim's help, we put miles of, of LED strips in. So, so a lot of the lighting is really built into the set and we talked about it a lot and then basically that allowed us to move in these spaces which you know, not that big, but, but you could move in any direction at any time and, and be in there and then change everything. Everything was, you could change um, all the colors every time. So, you know, when an alarm would go on, the lights would go red and, and all of that was part of the set design, which was great. Uh, Grant, what was your biggest challenge as a producer on the movie? Uh, I don't know what the biggest challenge was, but I would say the biggest curveball was that just a week or two before we started shooting, George and I got a call from Felicity <laughs> telling us that she was pregnant. <laughs> um, so that was a big, you know, that was a big issue. Um, and I won't go into the whole story, but we were going to not have her be pregnant in the film, you know, and we, we were going to deal with it with visual effects and all, we had all kinds of plans. And we started shooting it that way. About a week into shooting it, George just turned to me and he said, this is this is working, you know, because it's very difficult to be pregnant and play not pregnant. It's much easier to go the other way. And uh, he had the idea of let's just make her pregnant. And so all that stuff in the film that that was subsequent to when we started shooting. Um, and it was one of those in a way it was a happy. I don't think it was an accident, but it was a happy uh, it was a happy occurrence because I think it's really makes the film so much more powerful, particularly uh, uh, the ending. Yeah, it's crazy. it's crazy to me to learn that, that that wasn't part of the conception all along. It's so integral to it to me. I'll tell you 
the funny part too, because we were having to add scenes because things had to make sense. I like, name the kid and that kind. Of, and uh, I remember going to Jim. I think it was about a week before we shot it. Was it Jim? Maybe less. And said, "All right, we're going to do a sonogram of her. You know, ha having a baby and you know an ultrasound, but we need some sort of a machine that could do it." And I don't know, did you take like a 3D printer? What did you do that made it look like a, you go, well, this looks like that. And you it, threw was it, together already, really. it was already a set piece, right, Jim? It was just something no, 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 that- We actually designed that and built it overnight. Uh, oh, it, really? Yeah, yeah, it was, um, yeah, no, I, th I thought it looked good. It looked great, are you kidding? <laughs> that was happened fast. Uh, I think we've got time to maybe squeeze in one or two more questions here. Uh, there's a question about the music. Amazing score, they say. How did you choose the composer? Did you have a specific vision for the score or did you let the composer have free reign? Uh, listen, I've, I've done, I don't know, five or six films with Alexander Desplat. He's a friend. He also happens to be, I think, the best composer in the business. And, uh, and I absolutely had uh, ideas of what I wanted for it, um, knowing that the score was going to play a a character in the movie because there was so, so little dialogue. Um, and then he came in and would play pieces of music and we'd say yes or no and bits and pieces and bounce ideas off all summer long. And then by the end of the summer, he went into Abbey Road and it was very tricky because, you know, usually Grant and I would be sitting at Abbey Road and there would be Alexander conducting with a 150 piece orchestra. And, you know, and this time it was Grant and I here in LA um, <laughs> Uh, because of COVID, Alexander couldn't get into England, so he's in France. Everybody's zooming in five different zooms, uh, and the orchestra could only play about 15 musicians at a time, so it was pieced together in little stems, bit by bit by bit by bit. So it was complicated, um, more complicated for me uh, to understand it, because Alexander can listen to just the strings and not the horns or the percussion and go, that's exactly what I need, and I listen to it thinking, you know, I need it needs to be bigger, you know, so, but it was, you know, he's the best. He's, you know, look, all, everybody we're working with are, you know, you, you look at the design, the production design of this movie, I couldn't imagine it being any better. And the uh, cinematography is spectacular and the visual effects are out of this world. You know, we work with, we, we try to work with the best people. Absolutely. Uh, all right, well, I'm gonna squeeze one last one here. It's another music related question. Uh, someone wants to know where the inspiration came from for the Sweet Caroline scene. <laughs> I know Grant, Grant and I were trying to come, we, for a while it was going to be Fly Me to the Moon. We tried to look for a song that would still be around 30 years from now, would still have some, you know, some play, uh, which we think that will. We also wanted it to be fun and funny and light knowing that we were trying to use it as a time lapse, eventually we're going to use that to get ourselves, to buy ourselves time. Because originally in the script, it all happened so quickly, you couldn't necessarily have fixed everything and, and then have everything go wrong. So, uh, so we needed it as that. And Sweet Caroline was, you know, it's a fun song. We, we had to, you know, buy it from the, uh, from the Neil Diamond estate. And they had one thing, didn't they, Grant, where they said, but you can't make fun of the song. Right. You can't make a joke out of it. You're like, well, we're not going to make a joke out of that. It's a good song. We listened to literally, uh, we would listen to thousands of songs every day. We would just play songs for each other. And it, it, it was, car. it was fun. But uh, then George hit on that one. And we both thought that that yeah. would work really well. Well, we are out of time. So uh, I want to thank all you guys for coming and talking with me about the movie. This has been great. And uh, thank everybody out there for watching. And uh, I think it's, I'm gonna hand it back over to uh, Gwen from the Cinematheque. Yes, thank you so much, George, thank Martin, Jim, Matt, Grant for being with us. Thank you, Jim, for leading the conversation. Um, I'd like to thank the audience for zooming in. I invite you to join us uh, tomorrow for our conversation with uh, Thomas Winterberg and Matt uh, Mikkelsen and uh, to check our website, uh, consider becoming a member of the Cinematheque and um, Enjoy your weekend.